We thank you for it in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Now we're going to pick up where we left off. When, when I talked about, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to briefly go through these first slides so that I can kind of get our minds in that right direction and then pick up where we left off. If you remember, I said we were going to talk about obedience. I'm not going to read all these verses, but in 1 Timothy 3, as you have before you, verse 16, it says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of of godliness. And if you remember, we learned the word mysterion, and that is something that you can do naturally, some kind of natural action that allows you to interact with the supernatural. This could be good or bad, but it's something that you can naturally do that allows you to interact with the supernatural. And so this is the word that's used right, uh, right here before godliness. Then I wanted to go to this slide. 1 Timothy 4, 7 says this, exercise yourself towards godliness. This godliness of which is a great, the Greek word mega, a mega mystery, a mega something you can do to interact with the kingdom of God. Exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things having a promise in the life that now is and that which is to come. Then we come to this one, Hebrews 5.14. Solid food belongs to the mature, those whose perceptions, okay, this is your ability to perceive and understand, are trained by practice, trained by practice to discern both good and evil. Then the last slide, and then we're going to go into tonight's lesson, the last slide of what we covered last week, the perception, your perception is through developing the image of God. Now I'm going to take you to a whiteboard where I drew some stuff here in a minute so that I can make sure I communicate this first part in separating the image of God from the image of his son. So your perception is developed through the image of God. That's it. When you're developing your perception, you're developing the image of God that you were created in, which is your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. But I wanted us to see the word exercise or trained. It's the Greek word where we get the word gymnasium, gymnasia. It, so this is what he's saying is, this is something that is trained. It's not imputed. It's not given to us when Jesus rose from the dead, died on the cross and rose from the dead. He did not give us this training. He says, no, this is something you do. So we are going to train the image of God on the inside of us. Now I'm going to pull up this slide, and this is kind of where we left off, but what I'm going to do is go to this whiteboard over here. Now, what I did was I drew because I want to make sure that you understand something about the first Adam, last Adam, image of God, image of the Son. So over here, we have the first Adam. I drew the first man, Adam. He was made of dust. Inside him... God breathed in the image of God, a heart, a soul, a mind, and strength. Now, we already talked about that all four of these God has. So these are everlasting. These are eternal characteristics. These are not unique to man. They're unique to God. God has a heart. God has a soul. God has a mind. God has strength. That we covered in a past lesson. This is what he put on the inside of the first Adam. But pulling off of one of our past lessons, if you remember, I, I showed us how that Adam and Eve were not fully developed. I put here, never was fully developed because of sin. The image of God never was fully developed. Now, Adam was a perfect man made of dust. And he had the image of God on the inside of him. But if the word of God is true, and we know that it is, 
then God's desire even then was that Adam walk with him in the cool of the day, Adam and Eve walk with him in the cool of the day and grow and develop the heart of the image of God that was the on, on the inside of him because we know it was God's desire that human beings be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, so we've got to, well, I want us to really get a hold of this. this. This being conformed to the image of the son is not a result of men sinning. It was God's desire from the beginning. As I, I've said uh, times, and I'm pretty sure I said it in these classes, if we had never sinned the way we talk about Jesus, I'm talking traditionally, the way we traditionally talk about Jesus if we had never sinned, Jesus had no purpose. Am I to believe the word of God who became flesh and rescued us from our sins? Had we not sinned, he would have had no purpose. This was God's desire even before Adam and Eve sinned, that they would go through what we're talking about, transformation or being conformed to the image of the Son. This is not simply related to sin. What God is telling us by the grace of God is that sin did not ultimately rob us from being what God destined for us to begin with. So though Adam and Eve were perfect, sinless people, they were not fully developed into the image of the Son. This is a journey God had for them. And then Adam and Eve sinned. And God says, I have to rescue from sin and get them back on the journey. This is important that we hang on to this and realize that Jesus, well, all things were created by him for him. I don't want to get distracted off in that again, but we, we terribly underestimate Jesus. So, if this is true about Adam and Eve, and it is, then they were on the journey of transformation and conforming to the image of the Son. The journey, this journey, the one I'm talking about now, the journey Jesus took ahead of us and then said to us, follow me. Jesus came down and became a man and walked the journey that God intended Adam and Eve and their offspring, which would be us. He intended all human beings to walk through, to walk this journey and be changed into the image of the son. But because of sin, the son, the last Adam, whose image we're looking to bear, because of sin, he had to die for our sins, be raised from the dead, and then get us back on the track, on the journey of being changed into his image. Being conformed to the image of the son is not simply related to sin. It was God's desire. This is why he's called the firstborn of many brethren. It was God's desire that the sons of Adam be sons full, mature sons of God. This is why he says, given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints till we all grow into the fullness of Jesus. This was God's desire before sin. It's still his desire. But the thing, what I was going to say, the unique thing about Jesus, everything is unique about him, but things that I'm wanting to point out for our lesson tonight is this. We have, we were created with the image of God, but we're told in, in the word of God, and we're going to walk through some things, we are told we want to be transformed or conformed into the image of the son. We're created in the image of God, but that's a not matured heart, soul, mind, and strength. What was in Adam was not matured. This is a matured, fully developed Son of God, Jesus came down and lived the life. When he went to the cross 
He then said, I have done it. I am the perfect man. Now you say, well, of course he's perfect. He was sinless. Adam and Eve were sinless before they fell, but they were not perfected. They had not matured. God has got us on this journey. And now Jesus, just as we bore the image of the first Adam, which was an underdeveloped heart, soul, mind, and strength, then Adam sinned and we were cut off as a race of people from the presence of God. How do you develop your heart, soul, mind, and strength now? He got us cut off. We had to walk with God in the cool of the day to develop this. Adam lost that. God wasn't coming down anymore and walking in the cool of the day. How were we going to develop our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Jesus then comes down. And yes, he dies for our sin, but that's not the only thing he does. He comes and he develops the full, perfect heart of a man, soul of a man, mind of a man, and strength of a man, created in the image of God, but not fully developed. Jesus is the fully developed one. This is why we are now in pursuit of the image of the Son. What is the image of the Son? Same thing. Heart, soul, mind, and strength, but fully developed like Jesus. Now, if if you and I were totally perfected today, which we're not going to be, but I'm saying if we were totally perfected today, we would still never be the deity that Jesus is, but we can become a mature man, a mature son of God who walks with God. Here's our pattern. Here's our goal. He is the fully developed image of a son. This is our journey right here. We're on a journey. This is why he said, follow me. What's he saying? Follow in my footsteps. Do do what I'm, I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to demonstrate what to do. And if you do this, you will mature from the image that was passed on to you from the son of Adam. And listen, by the way, the image, that, the image of God that was in Adam, it, it, uh, these people that teach this total depravity, this image of God still existed. It, this did not die. This did not die when Adam sinned. The relationship with God walking in the cool of the day, the ability to mature it, that was cut off. But we read when Noah got out of the ark and God said to him about not killing uh, another man because men are in the image of God. So apparently all the way to Noah getting off the ark, there was a whole lot of sin happened. All the way to Noah getting off the ark, God still said the image is still there. The image is still there. It's how do we develop it? So then he sends his son, yes, to die for our sins, yes, to justify us, but also he became a life-giving spirit, the ability to impart from himself to us. So this is what we're looking to understand. I just wanted us to see this visual journey. Now, I'm going to pull over this slide right here, and I'm going to stay out of the way of it for here for a minute, and then we're going to walk through some slides. But I had told before, wait, let me just, let me do this. I had explained before in our last lesson that there are mysteries, okay? Remember mysteries, something natural I can do that allows me to interact supernaturally with God. As in Adam's case, you know what he naturally did with God to interact with God? He walked with him in the cool of the day. He heard God walking. He heard the voice of the Lord walking. And apparently they walked and talked. Well, that was natural for Adam. It was, but he was then interacting with the omniscient, omnipotent creator. And so God is saying, listen, I've given you things through which you, you can interact with me just as Adam did so that now we can begin to develop the image of the son. My original intention for all human beings, 
that they be conformed to the image of my son, that he is now the firstborn among many brethren. That includes sisters. It, all of us can be conformed to the image of the son. And so then I named some practical things last week and said, we're going to get into them. But the one we're going to focus on tonight is obedience. Obedience, because obedience is a unique category. If, if I say to you, you're to obey God, that is not telling you what specifically to do. That's just telling you generically what to do. So I want to open to us tonight, hopefully, thank you, Jesus, help me do this, open to us the mystery, mysterion, the sacred secret of obedience. And, and if there's anything, when, in case I don't say this at the end, never, never, never underestimate an act of obedience. And never, never, never underestimate an act of disobedience. Now, what I've done is I've divided some slides in to, to try to address particular things about obedience, just because I don't want these lessons to go on for nine years covering all this territory. So we're going to kind of hit some points about obedience. So let me pull that slide up, the first one, and I'm going to move out of the way so you can see this. Obedience. Obedience is the premier sacred secret. Now, I didn't really know the best word for this. I looked this word up on the internet. I don't know that this is the best word for it, but it's the first. It's the, the primary. It's the basis of all the other sacred secrets. Now, why do I say that? And remember the mysterions, the sacred secrets of how to interact with God. Here's the reason I say this. Obedience is the premier sacred secret of the kingdom. It was commanded before the fall. God commanded obedience before Adam and Eve fell. Now, I'm hoping y'all can see those little words at the bottom. Otherwise, I would have had like 30 slides. So I'm kind of trying to squish some together. It's Genesis 2.16. And the Lord God commanded man. Now, this is a command before Eve was even there. This is a command before sin was there. Notice God commanded obedience. Whoa. How important is obedience? And notice this, God is commanding a perfect man to obey. Ooh, that sounds like also what happened to Jesus. All right, now listen, Genesis 2, 16. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree in the garden you shall freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, I'd like to develop that more, but we, we won't have time to get through these other slides for him to have understood what it meant to die. But let's look at this one. Obedience is an observance revealed to obey. In other words, God said to him, don't eat. As it says down there at the bottom, Genesis 2, 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, God revealed to him what not to do. And he told him some things he should do, but he did not, even though he said you will die, Adam, I do not believe when we don't have a biblical basis for, for believing that Adam understood the consequences that would happen when he disobeyed. Now, God told him he would die, but that's not all that happened. The word of God tells us that all of creation, all of creation, creation is the heavens, the second heavens, and the earth. All of creation was subjected to futility. And it is, it's living in bondage right now, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. All of that. So when God told Adam, in the day that you eat, you'll surely die, that was true, but that was not everything. This is why I'm saying to us, never underestimate 
an act of obedience or disobedience. I don't think Adam dreamed that he would be sending the word become flesh to die because of his act of disobedience. I don't think he dreamed that the heavens and the earth were going to be subjected to futility because he disobeyed. I don't think he even dreamed how big, how, how catastrophic his act of disobedience was. I'm saying to you, just what is said here, when God reveals to us something to observe and he says, I want you to live this way or do this way, don't underestimate obeying or disobeying. Now, there's lots of examples of people who obeyed not knowing, <laughs> not knowing. And I'm going to say one is Noah. When Noah went on the ark, I'm saying about underestimating. When Noah went on the ark, I'm sure he and his sons at the time thought, okay, God has saved us because I was righteous in the sight of the Lord and you're my kids. We're on the ark. The flood came, destroyed all the wicked. But I don't know that Noah really understood that one of the most precious pieces of cargo on Noah's ark was a woman. Why a woman? Because God had already spoke prophetically and said through the seed of a woman, the one who would crush the serpent's head will be raised. Had a woman not been on that ark, it would have been all over. Even though no one, his sons could have got off, they didn't have women. They would have lived maybe ripe old age. Maybe God let them even live a 900 years apiece, a thousand years apiece. With no woman, no one to crush the serpent's head. I don't think Noah knew. I don't think he estimated to what magnitude it was for him to build that ark and carry that woman above the water so that the seed of the woman could come and rescue the entire creation. I'm saying this to say to you, listen, I know when, when obedience, it's such a mystery. It's like one of the mega, it's the mega mystery. Obeying God, you do not realize the generations that you're affecting when you obey. And you don't realize the generations that you're affecting when you disobey. This is why this is premier, obeying God, obeying God. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Obedience, and I, this I kind of already alluded to, obedience is a requirement on man, even if they are perfect and sinless. Adam was perfect when he got commanded by God, but look at Hebrews 5, 8. Though he, Jesus, was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Can you imagine the son of God who was not created from the dust of the ground? Not created like the first man, Adam. He was a real man, though. But his father was God, and he came through the womb of Miriam. Yet he had to learn obedience. Why? Obedience is everything. Obedience is a must to interact with God. The first Adam was interacting with God until he disobeyed. Disobedience is, I can't tell you how catastrophic it is. And today we're teaching people, teaching people in the church. Oh, don't worry. You don't have to worry about it if you disobey God. It doesn't matter. Jesus died on a cross for your sins. You just go to him and say, sorry, did it again. I'm saying to you, amen. God is so gracious. He does forgive. But I want you to know you're messing with destiny when you disobey God. You're messing with things that God ordained for you, for you to prepare, for you to do. And we take disobedience so lightly. Uh, one minister said to me one time, and I realized he was joking, but he said, you know what? I, I found it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. But that's not true. It's not true. If you have to ask forgiveness, 
It costs you. Remember the mystery of godliness? It is beneficial in this life and the life to come. Therefore, ungodliness costs you in this life and the life to come. And so that is not a true statement. The truth is we shouldn't say it even as a joke. We are to obey God. We must obey God. This is, this is key to transformation. Obeying God is key to transformation. All right, let's go to the next one. I'm going to get through. I've just got two slides more so that I can kind of pull this together. Obedience is work. Oh, I forgot to pull this up where you can see that. Sorry. Obedience is work and a work of the spirit slash grace and not a work of the flesh. Now I want to read two different verses, actually three, or reference the third one. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But look at this. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What, what does this mean? It means that God will lead us and give us commands. Those are, he said, my words are spirit and they are life. He will give us clear commands in the written word of God, but God will also speak to us. And we are to obey, whether it's the written word or if he speaks to us to obey, we should obey. Because listen, it is by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. And that means the, the sinful things, the things that pull us from God. God is saying, I will reveal to you things to do. I will show you a different way so that you can overcome the battles that you're battling in the flesh. But you can't figure them out without me. Just like Adam walking in the cool of the day. God did not say, Adam, you're a perfect man. I put the image of God on the inside of you. You should be able to develop yourself. Develop myself into what? Into the image of my son. I, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. I know. That's why I walk with you in the cool of the day. But I want us to know something. God is saying to us, listen, don't figure out. And because I'm, I'm going to be teaching principles to observe, but we're not to take these principles and, and self-apply them any way we want. We're to constantly be following the lead of the Spirit. So again, what he says here, if you live according to the flesh, you will die, meaning the natural way of doing things. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh or the deeds of the body, you will live. The second line there, hopefully, oh wait, I forgot. Let me get this back up so y'all can see that. I hope y'all can see those little words. But the, the second line there says, if you are transformed, it is by the grace of God. But if you're not, it's you. Okay, now listen, if you're transformed, it's by the grace of God. But if you're not transformed, it's you. Now I want to read 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by, this is Paul about himself, and it's written on there. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Notice by the grace of God. And his grace toward me was not in vain. What are you saying, Paul? His grace toward you is not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Paul is talking about him, him, his apostleship as compared to the other apostles. And he's saying it was given to me by the grace of God. But he didn't give it to me in vain because I labored harder than any of them. Well, what do you say? Just what I said. Obedience is work, but it's also a work of the spirit. It's both of you. But apparently people can resist the work of the spirit. So let me read the rest of this one. Let me pull it back up for you can see it. So his grace towards me was not in vain, but I have labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which is within me. So what I want us to see is that this is, this is going to, and, and now you've heard me say about us merging, that's on the next slide. But what this is taking, this is taking a mutual walk with God to become everything that the grace of God has equipped you to become. 
Now I want us to look down at this last line on this slide. Paul said of Israel, this is in Romans 10 too, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. What does this mean? This is why I was saying we need to be led of the spirit and to walk in the spirit and to walk by the word of God in order to go through this transformation. Because you can have a zeal for God and you can do all kinds of effort in your attempt to please God, but it needs to be according to the truth, according to knowledge. And this Greek word here where Paul quotes that from Romans 10 too, is the word I've taught y'all before, epinosis. Epinosis. Gnosis is knowledge, but epi is a higher knowledge. And as I said in my example, I know that it's painful for a woman to have a baby. I've seen on TV and when Judah was born, I saw it's painful for a woman to have a baby. But you women who've given birth have a knowledge of birthing a child I don't have. You have epinosis. I have gnosis. I have knowledge of it. You have experiential knowledge of it. Okay, this is what Paul is saying here. They have a zeal for God, but it's not according to experiential knowledge. It's not because they're walking with him in the cool of the day. Well, what are they doing? They're trying to figure out ways like the American church system today. We've developed a system that says you live in this system. This is what believers do. But we're kind of void of the epinosis of God. Where is the presence of God? Where is the healing and, and deliverance? Where are the things that said these signs will follow them that believe? We don't have epinosis of God anymore. Why? Because we're not walking in the sacred secrets. We're walking in church tradition, much like the Jews of Paul's day. And Paul himself was walking in a Pharisee of Pharisees. He said, I excelled above my brethren in Israel. Yet I was chief among sinners and I did not know the Messiah. And then he opened my eyes. And I said, I see it now. And then Paul began to walk in epinosis with God, experiential knowledge. This is where God is wanting us to come. Because when you walk with him, like the first Adam did before he sinned in the cool of the day, there's something that happens unique in us. Now, that's our next slide. I want to get to that so we don't run out of time. Okay. Uh, let's pull this over. Okay. Pull this up so you can see it. Obedience. Now, remember, obedience is a sacred secret. Obedience, and you're gonna, you're, you will love obedience. Obedience, I'm telling you, you want to kiss obedience. Thank you, Jesus, we're allowed to obey. Thank you, Jesus, you've made a way for us to see and understand that we may obey and come in contact with the true and living God. And, and receive from your image. Obedience allows, and this is my word instead of merging, <laughs> obedience allows transfusion. Now, I don't even know if that's the right word for this. I know that has to do with blood because I looked it up. But transfusion is putting blood from another mixing with yours. And this is the Greek word where we get, not, not transfusion, but, oh, hey, let me pull this up. First, let me read this. Obedience allows transfusion. There's the Greek word. We'll come back to it. Of the image of the son into those saved out of the sons of the first Adam. So remember, the first Adam, the image of God was passed on to us through the first Adam. But the last Adam, the image of the son is passed on to us. How? Just what he says, just what it says here, obedience allows for transfusion. And it's this, not, not transfusion, conforming. We are to be conformed to the image of the son. The word conformed is different than transformed. Transformed is metamorphous. That's where all the goods that you have are formed from a caterpillar to a butterfly. That's metamorphous. But this sum morphous, sum morphous is not 
the same as transformation. Now, transformation is still a, a legitimate part of our life. We go from the caterpillar to the butterfly. But when we're the butterfly, we want to bear the image of the sun. And that is a different Greek word. It's this word sumorphos. And this one means it's a merging or transfusion. So then the question becomes, how? How is this? This is how. Obedience. Every time you obey, a little more of him is infused into the image that was passed on to you from the first Adam, that was breathed into the first Adam by God. So the image of God was breathed into the first Adam, passed on to us through the sons and daughters of Adam. We, re we have this image of God, but it's stuck. It has the abilities that God designed, but it's stuck. It needs transfusion from God. It needs interaction from God. And lo and behold, God has given us a supernatural ability to receive transfusion from the sun. The one that I showed you when I, when I did on the whiteboard, the one who mastered and became the perfect man. He said, now I can impart to you the perfect man, the true son of God. I can impart to you. Well, Lord, I'm ready. Just impart it. And he's like, oh, no, no. It comes to you through obedience. Just as I myself, Jesus himself, had to learn obedience. Wait, are you saying the word of God that was with God and was God and all things were created by him for him had to learn obedience? Because he took the form of a man, though he was a perfect man, even a perfect man must learn obedience. Well, then, what are, so what's he saying to us? He's saying, my image is infused in you like a blood transfusion. My image is infused to you. Every time you obey, you're not the same as you were before. Every time you obey, I invade a little more of the image of God in which you were created. Every time you do what I say, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. That's not a scorecard where Jesus and, and the father are up there keeping a scorecard and say, did they obey? Okay, they get a check mark. Did they disobey? Oh, they get a check mark. God is saying, no, when you obey, I actually invade more of you. I'm actually affecting you. My, my image of my son is going through your veins, so to speak, not your natural veins, but your spiritual veins. Every time you obey, you're different. Every time you obey, you're more like the sun. Every time you obey. And so this is a gift of God. I'm telling you all of his commands. This is why King David, and you've heard me say it. King David said, your words, they're precious. I love your word. It's a light to my path, but it's not only a light to our path. They are life. They are life. He says they are life to those who find them, health to all their flesh. Why? Because when we hear the word of God, we can obey it. And when we obey it, it's like, wait, I'm fixing to go obey God for a little while. I need an infusion of the son. I need to be transformed. So I'm going to go obey God. Well, the truth is this should be our lifestyle. This should be our lifestyle. We should be eager to obey, but I want you to know something. What I read about Jesus, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And Paul said, I beat my flesh to keep it under. Why? Was he saying like, unfortunately, some of our Early Catholic brothers and sisters understood that suffering, like closing the door on your fingers or putting belts on with nails pointed into your flesh or sleeping on spikes and things like this, they understood that suffering to be the, the conforming. No, 
This is the suffering of the, of the flesh of Adam pulling against us and, and us saying, no, you're not going to get your way. I am going to obey God. It's about obeying God because every time we obey, we're more like him. But think of it, like I said before, about taking vitamins. This does not mean you take vitamin C today and all of a sudden you go out in the yard and you can jump over your house in a single bounce. You can't do that. That's not what it's saying. He's saying, I want you to know you're being transformed. You're being conformed. It's a process. It's a journey. Listen, Jesus had to accomplish this journey for two, well, many reasons, but two primary reasons. One, so that as a man, he would be at a place where he could face the cross and the shame and sin of the world being dumped on him. He had to reach a place that he was able to do that. Remember, he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? He's saying, son, you can do this and you have to do this. But the reason he was able to do that is because he spent the previous 30 years or 33, 30 years, the 30 years being changed and learning obedience through the things which he suffered. Therefore, when it came time, as he said, to drink that cup, and he said, my soul is like a storm inside me. I don't want to drink this cup, but can I tell my father no? It is for this reason that I came. He couldn't tell no, but how did he say yes to such a thing? To take the sins of the world on him and he's never known sin. How could he do that? Because he learned obedience and it apparently was a suffering journey. In other words, sometimes he just didn't want to put up with another criticism or, or another remark or, or another lie about him. But he did put up with it. He did bear it. Why? So that he could rise to the occasion of a perfect man and then say now, through faith, all you sons and daughters of God, I did it. And now if you will obey me, I will transfuse into you my image. And you will eventually come into the full stature of the image of Jesus. Now, listen, as I said, we're not going to become deity. We're not going to be seated at the right hand of the Father. God's not going to get us confused with Jesus and say, oh, I couldn't tell you apart. That is not going to happen. But we can become perfected people. Now, I don't mean in this life. We're not going to be perfected in this life. But as Paul said, not as though I have attained. But I just say, well, don't worry about it. It's all taken care of on the cross and we'll get it all when we get there. No, not as though I have attained, but I press towards the mark of the upward call to be conformed to the image of the Son. What an honor. What an honor and the glory that's going to be revealed in us when we're obedient. So we're going to stop right there. Principle primary for all of the other sacred secrets we're going to learn and things we need to practice and things we need to do. Learn obedience. And you, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not a policeman and I'm, I've got my hands full taking care of me. You know when you're obeying and you know when you're not obeying. Obey God. You have no idea the glory that's set before those who are obedient. Now, listen, one more thing. I hope you know that the apostle Paul, who beat his flesh to keep it under, who ran his race, who finished his course, is My not going to be in the same position that, that the guy who was turned over for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit would be saved in the day of the Lord. Let us not be those people who God says, I have to destroy their flesh just to save them because they're chosen to go the wrong journey. They've ignored obedience. 
No, we embrace obedience. Thank you, Jesus, that we can obey. I just want to pray and then we'll do questions if there's any questions.